Okay, I, I'm I'm glad that uh, I'm glad Lynette's here too because uh, I'm going to need her help with this one. Um, so Lynette, you get to be put on the spot. I hope you're looking forward to that. Um, so the I, I I wanted to have when we sort of laid these out, I wanted to have uh, after we talked about all different aspects of UCC history and polity, I did want to have one class to talk about the future, uh, an honest assessment of the future and what that will look like uh, for bearing for first congregational for other churches in the UCC. <clears throat> And I, uh, I want to assess the future as I, as I usually do when I talk to folks about this, um, as realistically and as soberly as we possibly can, because um, the mainline church does not face an easy future. That's not true. That's true for the Methodists. It's true for the UCC. And, and I think it, it helps us to think through some of these issues uh, and also to think through what our opportunities are, because I, I wouldn't be devoting far too many hours a week in my entire career. Uh, to something that I didn't think had a future that I didn't believe in um, with all my heart. So, uh, but that doesn't mean there aren't challenges. And I, I, I imagine the challenges in the UCC mirror the same challenges um, in the UMC. Uh, but the polity structure and the approach is a little different. So, I mean, I'm, that's why I think it'd be fun to have a conversation about it. So from for my seat, and again, I, I know you all thought aloud for this, or I'm sure you have. Uh, there are certain structural challenges um, that the UCC faces. Uh, and these structural challenges um, should not be discounted and they're not insignificant. And I wanna you know, name them. One is, uh, one's a simple one. UCC churches, I mentioned this before, UCC churches uh, predominate in areas like the North and East uh, and they're not very present in the Sun Belt. Um, and there are a lot of churches in rural areas and a lot of places in rural America are becoming less and less populated. And so just by means of the simple fact of demographics as destiny, uh, structurally, that'll mean a lot of churches are gonna be hurting over the next 20 years. So when I was in Iowa, there were 175 UCC churches in Iowa. Um, and again, Iowa is a much smaller state than Texas, and yet there are two and a half times more churches in Iowa than there are in Texas. Um, in the state of Iowa, there were over 170 churches when I was there. And the vast majority of these were in very rural communities back when the, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 dictated the settlement patterns in a place like Iowa. So most people had 80 or 160 acre farms. What it meant was there was population density in these neighborhoods, in these, in these areas, and that's no longer the case. Uh, the average farm is 2,500 acres and up in Iowa, and these towns are a fraction of their former selves. And these churches, you know, so of the 175 churches, I would guess solidly 100 demographically are, are, are going to be dead. Even if you have Jesus leading them, they'll all, they're going to die. Uh, and that's just, a, that's just an Iowa conference. But think about that. Of 170 some odd churches, on, a, a, on an optimistic side, 100 are going to die, just based on these shrinking communities. And that's true in states across the country where there are a lot of UCC churches. And I, I'm, I'm sure that the Methodists face the same thing in some of, their, in some of the areas where they're strong, is that you know, these, these er demographics are changing. And the UCC did not do a good job uh, from its founding until the present day about starting planting new churches in the Sun Belt. And we're currently, we've been paying a price for that and we're gonna keep paying a price for that. So that's just, that's a, that's a structural challenge of the UCC is where these churches are located and that demographics are going to push them. So when people say, oh, well, different, the denomination is shrinking, this, that, thing, I'm like, well, of course it is. <laughs> like, just look at, you could just, you can just read a census report. Like it's, it's not, that's not surprising. Um, another structural uh, challenge is uh, some of the stuff I mentioned about the shrinking resources for both the conference and national staff. And again, this is a problem that's uh, similar with the Methodist church as well. So you have churches that are shrinking and um, one of the first things that gets cut, unfortunately, is giving to the state and national church. And also on, on top of that, in the 1960s and 70s, you had this explosion of people uh, of, of positions in the state and national church, such that you know you had you've you've had over the last especially 20 years a real structural re realignment in the church, um, away from the state and national level, um, and much more to the local congregation. So that's one of the things that's happened in the UCC is that the sort of shift in weight and energy and focus has very much moved. To the local church, and that was not the case though in the 60s and 70s. You know, as I was describing the history before, there were a lot of there's a lot of great hope for the UCC about what the UCC would bring in in terms of ecumenical work, and then in terms of justice work, and 
you know, there was a lot of effort put in and a lot of resources put into the state and national level in order to do that. And now <laughs> those resources simply aren't there. And one of the fun things that's happened, and I'll talk about this later, is there's been this structural shift um, to local congregations. Um, let's see here. Here's another structural thing, um, and that is the demographics of clergy. Uh, if you look at any statistics, um, and again, I'm sure it's the same in the UMC, if you look at any statistics, um, you know, something like, and Lynette can correct me with these stats, but it's something crazy where like 60% of UCC clergy are 60 or above in age. I mean, it's something in that ballpark. I don't, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's something in that ballpark. Um, so within the next 10 years, 60% uh, plus um, of UCC clergy will be retired. <laughs> I mean, that's just going to happen. Um, and so there is this impending clergy uh, shortage. Now, I, I'll come back and talk about this more later because it's more complicated than the numbers sort of suggest, but uh, that's, a, that's a structural reality of the church. Uh, another fun structural reality of the church is the decline in uh, in-person three-year seminaries, where there was a time when it was assumed that someone graduated from college and then they went to a seminary in person for three years, they picked up a wife along the way because they were always male at this time, they picked up a wife along the way, and then they took their wife off to someplace, uh, who, by the way, was an unpaid church employee now uh, at full time. <laughs> and that's sort of the way church functioned. Uh, shockingly, uh, theological education does not function that way anymore and hasn't functioned that way for a long time. And so there's been a real, real realignment in terms of theological education that I think is worth talking about because it has implications for churches and especially churches uh, like Bering or First Congregational. Um, another uh, thing that's uh, a reality is a lot of UCC churches, like a lot of UMC churches, uh, have a lot of old buildings. And these old buildings uh, have pros and cons. Um, the big con is when you're trying to pay for one, <laughs> It's just one thing after another. And it's just so painful to see so many hard of, of your resources, limited resources of a church go towards fixing up old buildings. Uh, that is true across the UCC. I mean, there are very few parts of the, I mean, First Congregational, whose building was built in, whose sanctuary was built in 1961, is basically brand new uh, compared to most churches in the UCC. The church I served in Iowa was an 1895 building. Mm -hmm. um, and you go in the Northeast and they're, I mean, the majority of sanctuaries in the Northeast are uh, 19th century buildings, some even seven, uh, 18th century buildings. Um, I mean, there are, it's just structurally, that's just another expense that the church has that to deal with, um, which is fun. So, so I think those are just a few of the challenges structurally that the church faces. Um, and I, it's important to name those. And you also have the societal factors of fewer people um, engaging with churches. Um, certainly there's less denominational affiliation than there was before. There's faster turnover of churches. There's been this move that um, most of us have lamented towards a very consumerist approach to church. Um, and that has led to, again, a sea change in what's facing us as we look towards the future. And so, now we have an opportunity to think uh, creatively among us here. Um, what does that future look like? And I'll give sort of a few guesses on my part, and then I'm fascinated to hear what you'll have to say um, because it's a future that we're all going to share a part of. So I think my first question, John, is: yep. Does anyone on the call, I mean, on the Zoom, do you see things being dramatically different in the Methodist Church as in the UCC? I mean, they seem to be aligned to me. Okay. Pretty much the same. The Methodists just started out bigger. Yeah. Well, and then yeah. the Methodists also have this huge upper structure that is killing the church um, in terms of what it's costing to maintain it. Not that it doesn't do good work, but yeah. But don't yeah. worry, they're going to they'll get rid of church and society, so that'll <laughs> that'll cut jobs. <laughs> but um, yeah, a lot of I mean, bearing we spend a lot. We have this wonderful building that's also a dinosaur that just every time we turn around there's another expense <laughs> you should have not, seen it and they're not little expenses oh no no we haven't even got yeah. stained glass windows <laughs> oh, yeah. and we just paid two million dollars 
well, not quite just, but we paid $2 million to fix it up. Yeah. About 12 years ago, or it's longer than that, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, oh, yes, it's 20 years at least. Yeah. I think they have the same um, issue when it comes to the rural parts of, of Texas. Yeah. You know, I used to tease that you couldn't throw a rock that you didn't hit a Methodist church. And, and that's still true, but, you know, the, there are so many churches that are dying simply because of, of uh, the demographics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I just wanted to, you know. Yeah, like, no, no, thank, thank, the, the, thank you, Lynette. The, the Methodist Church is facing the same thing, but like David said, they're just bigger. Yeah, and that's that, that's where there's some interesting as we think through this. Um, well, I, we'll, we'll we'll come back to that because uh, there's some interesting things to bring up. So uh, some of the things about the future uh, that I think are interesting new realities um, that uh, I think are fun realities. I mean, I. Again, I'm not. I'm a fundamentally an optimistic person. I think most Christians should be. We are people of resurrection, after all. Um, and so, the in terms of the national structure, I, I I think it's cool to see how the national structure has evolved. As I mentioned earlier, the amount of money spent on board seats and useless meetings uh, has been cut by like 80 percent over the last 15 years, uh, which is great. Uh, it's a lot of money saved. Um, is there more money to be saved in the national setting? Yes, primarily around general synod. Um, and there have been conversations around that, and I'm sure there'll be more conversations around that. You know, every two years we put on this great general synod, and all the delegates to general synod, because they represent the church, go, you know, on, they get their expenses all paid for by the church. And so between that and speakers they bring in and different things, I mean, general synod is quite expensive. And, the, well, the, the and there's no point in having it anymore since they got rid of the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there was a big thing in the, they, I mean, for decades, I think it goes back to the Ames Synod in 85, I'm pretty sure. Someone told me it was back in the Ames Synod of 85, where from 85 until, gosh, 2015, every synod, uh, the host uh, city, one of the things they did was bake cookies hundreds for everybody who showed up. Uh, so as you came in every single day for every session, there were always cookies available, uh, baked by all the church members of the local churches that were in that area. Um, and so for the, for the, for the big synod in 2007 for the 50th anniversary synod, which was just packed to the gills. I mean, they, I mean, there must've been at least, there must've been 20,000 people there. Uh, I mean, this is where Barack Obama spoke, Bill Moyers spoke, all these other people spoke. It was, it was a, an amazing, um, setup, but they had cookies for all those people. <laughs> I mean, all of them. I mean, there was, everybody would cookies. Yeah, um, now they don't have them. So it's not as much fun. <laughs> <laughs> but so synod, synod still is one thing that has to be wrestled with in the national setting. But otherwise, the national setting is is they they all there have been a lot, there were a lot of hard you know battles that were fought. That sounds like the Methodist Church has has to fight going forward. Uh, and there was a lot of blood that was left on the carpet during those fights. But the fun thing is is that for the most part, those fights are those fights are over with. Um, those the, those fights have already been fought. And so the nice thing is, like again, the UCC with their with their building uh, in in Cleveland, uh, they decided to sell the hotel that they had. They had the hotel there so they could have these big board meetings. Well, they don't have as big a board; uh, they're not spending nearly as much on that stuff. And the hotel was, you know, an asset that they could use to reinvest in other things. So they sold the hotel, um, their office building. Uh, they're in the process of renovating and renting out several floors of their office buildings that are not being used anymore to generate income to try and you know help do it. One of the things they're doing I thought was cool is uh, they want to start doing more about uh, selling UCC branded clothing uh, where they basically have in-house designers who can come up with really cool designs and then tailor it for your local church. Um, and then the local church buys them at say $15 a t-shirt, but you know $5 of which of each t-shirt goes to pay things in the national setting. Um, and so things like that, they could be creative approaches to how do we leverage what we have to help the churches at the same time fund what we have. Um, you know, at long last, they've gotten much better at trying to help the churches implement, you know, new website technologies and different things. And I think they're really, they really are trying with the resources they have to be as nimble as they can. One of the, one of the coolest things in the UCC in the last, you know, 15 years, 20 years, um, was this, uh, and this is great, this is classic UCC. So uh, there were, there were led by some people at the national office. Um, they reached out to people in local churches, ministers in local churches, uh, who were very talented and well-regarded in the denomination. And rather than have people in the national setting of the church write curricula for various things, um, and then just present it, deus ex machina, into the, into the local churches, uh, they, they had these 
these ministers, these local ministers write the materials. Um, and these are really talented writers. And so all of a sudden, there's this, it's called the Still Speaking Writers Group. It's expanded since then in different things. But you go to the UCC website and you look at all these incredible materials that have been produced in the last 15 years in terms of stuff on what are the sacraments, on great devotionals, on a daily devotional, on all the different material that gets produced from the national setting. That's all produced pretty much on volunteer labor um, by people in the local church. Uh, really talented folks in the local church. It's remarkable, um, but it's a way that the church can, you know, still produce this different kind of stuff because there's plenty of talent in the churches. How do we use it better? Um, you know, one of the books that got sent around for General Synod, actually written by a great mentor and friend of mine, and <laughs> it just came out, so I haven't read it yet, um, but the entire book is on sharing resources among churches. How do we do that? So for instance, in Houston, how does Bering and First Congregational, St. Peter United, some of the other churches around share our resources, whether it be in terms of youth stuff, whether it be in other things and in, in missions, how do we do more work together? Because reduplicating resources, if, 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 if any time we can avoid reduplicating resources, why not do that? Um, and that's, that's going to be the future. Um, it already is the present in a lot of places. And as you go towards the future, it'll be increasingly the future. Uh, and it shouldn't be a future that we're afraid of, but one that we embrace because there actually are a lot of really talented people that we have. And when we combine our sources together, we actually have a lot there. The, um, it's too bad Leslie Jackson's not here on the call, uh, but he's been talking with uh, the folks in, you know, I think it's called Cornerstone. It's the building and loan fund for the UCC. So the UCC national setting has one, you know, stuff that they lend money to churches at favorable interest rates to try and do capital campaigns and things like that. And one of the things that they're, one of the whole new things that they're doing is working with churches on selling their old buildings and trying to reallocate funds for various ways, whether it be building new spaces um, or doing other creative things with that money as a way of revitalizing churches and trying to make them, you know, trying to, trying to give them a, a new sort of lease on life. And there's one example of that here in Houston where, you know, Bethel Church, you know, it's this church that used to exist on Washington Street in between Shepherd and Durham, had a whole city block. And the church had been dying for decades and they sold the building and they sold the building since it was, it, it was it's so old, it had no deed restriction. <laughs> and so it was, a whole, it was a whole block. So they're able to sell the building for millions of dollars um, and use that money, some of which they gave to the association. They gave half a million dollars to the association so the association could give grants to churches in the association. And the association is not big. Grants of like, hey, here's an extra 25 grand bearing to go start a new ministry. What's in your budget? Here's an extra 25 grand as, as a grant to go do something creative to go expand and do some new ministry. Um, and, it, and you know, Bethel then sort of is doing this restart down in Oct 88, and I hope it's going well. And they've been a very talented pastor. It's never easy to do those things, but they're doing creative things. They ended up buying a retreat center, an old Catholic retreat center down there. Um, you know, so that, you know, they're different, trying to think through these different kind of things about what we can do. There are plenty of resources in various places. Uh, that are creative. And there's a lot more of this creative type stuff uh, that you see popping up in the UCC, which I think is really fun. Um, in terms of um, clergy and uh, uh, sort of finding clergy for churches and also theological education, uh, also fun topics. So I'm less pessimistic than some are about the clergy statistics. Um, and it's the same reason why I'm not very pessimistic, or why I'm, I'm, why I'm why like, uh, like people will come into first congregational, let's say, I'm sure bearing is very different, but the first congregational will come in, they'll look around and be like, gosh, there are a lot of older people here. Man, you know, that's tough. Uh, you know, it's, this church probably won't be around in 20 years. Um, and I, I, I say, I tend to say several things in response. I say, first of all, uh, we're a church that, that appeals to people generally in a stage of life where they've, they've lived a lot of life and they're looking for more nuance in the church. We don't give black and white theology. You know, the reality is your prefrontal cortex is not developed until you're 25, all right? In a stage of your life, in a stage of your faith, you're probably not gonna find a church like a UCC church until a little later on. And you know what? That's totally fine by me. I don't care. And you know what else? You know, people who are older and close to retirement, A, they've got time on their hands and B, they've got money to give. <laughs> and C, they know what church is like. This is like, oh my God, I don't need to train them anything about church. Um, that's not to say I don't love the young people in our congregation. I love the young people in our congregation and we do have a good group of young people. But I, just because the demographics of say the clergy are older, doesn't mean there won't be clergy there because a lot of clergy in the UCC are second career clergy. Look at Lynette as a great example. Um, you know, there are, people feel a call to the ministry at different stages of life 
and that's fantastic. Um, I'm confident that there will be clergy there. That, that the so-called clergy, it's just like that, oh gosh, your, your, your congregation is aging. I'm like, we have plenty of people joining the church. But if, if someone, yeah. we, we, but we people join the church at age 80. And I'm like, that's great. If someone at age 80 finds our church, fantastic. You know, hopefully they'll have 25 years at FCC and that'll be great. <laughs> well, remember the words of Kathy Bates, I'm older and have better insurance. Yeah. <laughs> right, I mean, it's, just, it's a sense is yes, we are a, an older denomination, but I, that's fine. You know, I mean, obviously I want to appeal to a broad, you know, age range. Um, and I'd love to have sort of, and, and we do have, a, as I said, we have a broad range, I'm sure, as I'm sure Baring does. But it's like with the clergy, I, I, I'm not, I mean, th th I, I'm confident that there will be clergy. Uh, because as long as the gospel is being preached, and as long as people are doing the work uh, of God in various places, people are going to feel a call. Uh, and they're going to respond to that call. And you know, again, it's up to each of us to try and lift up people within our congregations um, to hear that call. But it, I, I, I'm not, I'm not as pessimistic as as, as some are. I, another thing about uh, clergy is that there can be a lot more bivocational clergy in the UCC, uh, as I'm sure in the UMC as well. So uh, a lot of these churches are shrinking, but the way the churches go in terms of size, you, you probably noticed this in the UMC. Uh, churches will shrink and then they'll be really stubborn for a while <laughs> and then they'll shrink and be really, really stubborn for a while because there's certain sizes that you need to maintain certain programs and people very much want to hold on to those programs. And so um, when you get down to, uh, you know, a couple hundred members, uh, you need to have a couple hundred members to have usually a full-time clergy plus music plus, you know, sort of some sort of administrative support. Uh, and below that, those things get more difficult. So churches are going to hold on to that level for a little while and be aggressive to hold on to that level. Uh, but once you dip below that level, there are actually other sort of plateaus. It's not as though you're just going to fall off. There are plenty of churches that there are plenty of people that really enjoy being in a small church with, oh, sorry, uh, where they know everyone. And there's a lot of draw to that, but you need to find ways to have bivocational pastors as a result. Um, and so a lot of these congregations, I think, are not just just because they're shrinking below the capacity to pay a full-time minister doesn't mean they're going to be going away. Um, a lot of those churches will be around and be quite healthy for a long time. Um, and there could be a lot of very talented bivocational ministers. Um, and that's very much going to be a reality of the UCC going forward. And we have to find good ways of lifting up and celebrating bivocational ministry. Um, and sort of as a part of that, a few years ago, this is where <laughs> uh, my first synod, I sort of got myself in hot water. Um, I was there for the with along with the you know along with the massachusetts conference and um what was coming before general synod was what they called at the time alternative paths to the ministry where they could grant someone ordination full ordained status without going to seminary and so you know john page just out of seminary um <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is outrageous. You know, I went to the, I went to the mic and I was like, here is in front of this 800 delegates and all these, you know, sort of observers. And I'm like, and this is, and they blow you up your face on the screen, of course, and you're speaking at these things. And I'm just like, this is, this is outrageous. I'm like, do you, I, you're not going to go read Karl Barth on your own. I'm sorry. And it's not going to happen. And you're not going to do Greek and Latin and Hebrew on your own. I'm sorry. It ain't going to happen. Uh, you're not going to do all these different things on your own. You need sort of communities and school helps with that. Um, and I, and I was like, well, and I sat down and quote, I mean, the privileged white boy from Massachusetts getting up talking about the need of a seminary education uh, went over like a fart in an elevator for a church that likes liberation theology. Uh, and so there was like 400 people lined up to my opposite me and they just took turns <laughs> uh, calling out my provisional elitism. And, and I was like, okay. And then I got up again and, and yelled from my mouth again because <laughs> I don't learn my lesson very well. And I was like, I was like, well, you know, now you're going to create this two turns, this two tiered ministry where all of a sudden you have the clergy with MDivs and the clergy without MDivs, and this is going to be all this, that, and the other thing. And then, you know, another 400 people lined up to, <laughs> to help me. Um, thankfully, I, I've, I've, um, I had many conversations during that synod about this issue <laughs> and quite a few since then. Um, and I, uh, I, I actually hold a very different opinion now than I did then on, on those types of things. Certainly, um, there is a time and place for, you know, full-time seminary in a, in a residential setting. Um, and that will be there certainly within the attached to the major research universities. Um, you know, again, you look at a place like Duke uh, or a place like Emory, 
you know, Candler, I mean, those, those places aren't going anywhere. Um, I assume Perkins is the same way. Um, if you're attached to a major research university, um, that seems to be uh, a ticket to long-term survivability for that model of education. Um, and as I said, there'll always be people who avail themselves of that model of education. At the same time, um, there, are, uh, there are a lot of ways that we could do really, really high quality theological education, uh, not in seminary. And in fact, I know quite a few people who graduated from seminary who weren't actually as well theologically prepared as they should have been graduating from seminary, <laughs> and that there are better ways to train people, particularly for work in a local church. So, uh, you know, I think about when I sat on the Committee on Ministry in Eastern Massachusetts, uh, we had all these candidates coming through from Harvard Divinity School. And Harvard Divinity School is a great uh, institution, um, great divinity school. Uh, but Harvard Divinity School did not, for instance, offer any course on systematic theology. Because that's not the thing. They're all about, you know, it's, it's, it's Unitarian historically, and they're very big into world religions and comparative religions. And you could take 10 classes on Buddhist studies, but there was nothing on Christian systematics. <laughs> and, and there were different things where, like, these candidates from Harvard Divinity School would show up. And we'd start asking them questions and we'd be like, well, you're clearly very bright and you clearly, you know, studied a lot of your different subjects, but you don't know the basics and you got to go work in a church and you don't know how to answer half these questions. Um, and so there were certain times where we required candidates to go to a different divinity school or seminary to get the classes that Harvard, because it's Harvard, wasn't willing to offer. Um, and so it was one of those things, just because you have a fancy degree doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be having the right tools um, to work in a to work in a congregation. So there are, um, there are plenty of ways uh, to equip people for ministry and there's a need for it. You know, we need to make sure that seminary is affordable, that people don't graduate with debt and that people actually can get access to it in different places so that they can serve the churches. And so the challenge for the church in the future, one of the challenges is the ongoing fine development work in terms of online education, which is expanding rapidly uh, at all sorts of seminaries, you know, Methodist seminaries, seminaries all over the country, um, online education, uh, more conferences, UCC you know, fo focused conferences, and also there's an opportunity for uh, large churches in certain areas to take on the role that used to be done. So before seminary existed, the first seminary in the country was Andover Seminary, or a congregational seminary in Massachusetts, it was founded in 1809, very first seminary in the country. Before then, it turned out clergy had a good education. And the way they did it was after they graduated from college, they actually did you know, the same thing that lawyers or doctors would do. Uh, they would go do basically an intern, an extended intern period in a larger church with a well-respected minister there. And they would go through the, and then they'd go before the committee on ministry there. And that's how it would be, and then that, that's how it would be functioning. And that's very much um, a model that I think we'll see more and more of going forward. And in a way that I think will be very effective, we have to think as a, as a denomination and as an association how we want to do that and create space for that. David, yeah, you had a question. Here. Yeah, it. Yes, I know it. Uh, does the UC, the Methodist Church has a program for licensed local pastors, course of study, and an alternative way to actually be ordained if you wish. Now, this derived from the Methodist belief until the late 19th century that nothing ruined a preacher more than a college education. Yeah. Um, and that's why there are no Methodist universities founded throughout most of the 19th century. But is there a, a way of, of, of that sort of lay education or a course of study that is an alternative to seminary in the, uh, in the UCC? Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's a route that many of the smaller, because it's, they can afford in the smaller rural churches. Yeah, so the, the thing, I mean, I'm curious what Lynette has to say about this, but the, uh, so the CE director at the church that I worked in in Iowa, uh, she went through a pretty intensive um, lay education program that then was offered to the Southern Conference. Um, I think it was something, it was an online education offered to something in Atlanta, out of Atlanta, uh, that she got a pretty thorough education from that. And that allowed her to be what's known in the UCC as a licensed minister. So she was able to, she was licensed to preach and officiate the sacraments and things like that, uh, even do weddings, um, but, only in the, but only in the context of that one congregation. Congregation. Um, yeah, and so that, that, that program was there. I don't know how healthy that program is or if it's still around. I know that there are thoughts about different programs, but there's definitely, 
there's a need for it. And I think different people are trying to think creatively about this. That's what I'm curious if Lynette knows more about what's out there now. Yeah, we don't we don't have the equivalent, David, to the course of study that the UMC right. has. It's just a matter of size. Uh, but uh, this being a licensed minister in the UCC is the same as being a licensed minister in the UMC. You know, it's that particular church and you can uh, perform the sacraments in that. And the licensed ministers often are used the same way in the UCC as they are in the Methodist in more rural parts of the country. Uh, well, but it's also, it, they're, they're not necessarily bivocational. They're just usually poorly paid. Um, <laughs> which which is a different thing and uh, so in all of these instances i think it's really an opportunity to think outside the box and uh, i'm not aware of anything nationally or in other conferences that are equivalent to the course of study but um, doesn't mean we can't come up with it well you know people that go through the course of study and are licensed local pests don't pass through the board of ordained ministry they are sort of the board of ordained ministry handles their education and various things, but they're not certified. And occasionally you get some pretty appalling theologies that come through, which I don't suppose is a problem with the UCC because you can believe whatever you want, <laughs> as long as you're not actually Unitarian, except historically. Um, and you went to Harvard. Well, actually, we go to no, Yale, well, <laughs> others go to Yale, of course. Yes. <laughs> and uh, if you're the... really right wing, you, you go to Princeton Theological Seminary. <laughs> so, well, you left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the yeah i mean the uh yeah there's in terms of the th i mean the, I, I i think the we have to think about i think there's a lot of opportunity here in the in, in terms of us trying to think through how we do these things um and an opportunity for thinking through also some of the theological stuff because david the i you know, the, we need to, the UCC has wrestled a lot with what to do about theology because it's a non-credal church. How do you maintain theological rigor while still being a non-credal church and not requiring any particular sort of towing the line in terms of orthodoxy? And this, as, 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 I, as I alluded to last week, it's very much association by association in terms of the committees on ministry. And I, I think that we, we need to continue to do more thinking on that. And the denominations thought a lot about it. I, I'm one of those people that I like theology. I think theology is wonderful. I love preaching very theology. Like my sermon this Sunday is on process theology and, and, and the Trinity and getting really into, into the weeds on that. Some people in the congregation, I think, uh, won't enjoy it as much, but um, I'll, I'm just rolling up my sleeves and we're going to dive right in. Um, and so I'm, I'm, yeah, but I, I think that there's a, there, there's a real need to, because um, as, as, I, as I alluded to last week, I don't care what your theology is. I want to make sure it's well thought out um, and that you know, that, and that you can respond to questions that people have, questions about theodicy, questions about, you know, the nature of God and what that means, the question of why are we praying and what does that mean? What's the nature of worship and necessity of it? Uh, I mean, theology has so many real world, real world implications that regardless of what your theological system may be, you have to answer those questions if you're going to be a pastor. Uh, and you have to answer them in convincing ways. So, you know, who is Jesus and, you know, why is he significant? Um, I mean, these different, I mean, what, what is atonement? How am I saved? I mean, is sanctification a thing? And what does it look like? Uh, and no matter who you are, you have to be able to answer those questions. And, and where, I, where I think we run into trouble is if you have members of your congregation who want to have your theology, their theology reflected in you as the pastor, then that's sometimes a problem. Uh, but if you can speak to it, like John is saying, then then it's somehow. Sure. Different. But, um, you know, I ran into issues where um, and I, you know, you find this hard to believe not all people who are gay necessarily have liberal theology and they would come to Cathedral of Hope. And what they wanted was the exact same theology they had in their old church. But they just wanted it to be OK to be gay. And and I knew I, people at Bering. Yeah. I knew people at Bering who stood up and said, how can you stand in that pulpit and tell me I'm not going to hell because I'm gay? And so and I you just that, sort of look around and you yeah. hold your breath and say, what is going on here? So and they'd I, leave. I think the issue is not just the theological education as far as the thoroughness of it. I like what you say, John, that they can, they can they've thought it through. Um, but I think the other issue uh, moving forward is 
you know, you know this, uh, and probably so does Diane and so does John. You get out of seminary, and that doesn't mean you know how to be a pastor. Oh, you know, at all. And, nor does it mean you know anything about uh, running a, a business because that's a church is a business. You know, and I can tell you that I would have been lost had I not been older and had spent 35 something years in corporate America because I had to do all the paperwork for the founding of the church. Uh, and and you know, I did the budget and everything because we there was just a handful. And so I think, you know, I know Perkins has changed that and they've, they've got a- um, They still don't teach you how to run a copy machine though. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> Or in the old days, how to fix the, the bulletin folder. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. Don Sinclair could pray over it. He was the only one who could fix it. Yeah. So, you know, I think so there's twofold. I think you've got the, the theological um, education. How do we make that happen in alternative ways? And the other thing for younger clergy is how do you run a church? Well, mm -hmm. you know, theologically speaking, the UCC, um, it may not be credo, but the statement of faith pretty much sums up the classic. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, very the much classic so. Classic Trinitarian I, statements of, and, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I mean, the, although the, 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 it's funny because it does vary congregation to congregation. And First Congregational is one of these churches. I mean, they are, the, the, the loudest theological voices are all the staunchest Unitarians. I mean, they are just staunch oh. Unitarians. And... So whenever I preach on things like the Trinity, like I'm preaching on this Sunday, I always get just this whole <laughs> this whole series of emails that come into my inbox. But um, this Sunday isn't Trinity Sunday. I think it is. It should be. Otherwise, I'm otherwise is I'm in it? trouble. <laughs> no, because, I'm no, because Trinity Sunday used to be this. Oh, yes, it is. Because in the old days, the Methodist ministers um, were went to their new churches, and their first Sunday was Trinity Sunday, not the first of July. And it used to be very amusing on the few when to see how most of the pastors who came would ref did not want to have someone else do the children's sermon. And, so, and I particularly remember Andy Noel. And but it was interesting to see how they were going to take these five-year-olds and teach them about the Trinity. And so you <laughs> saw things, so you saw things like, well, it's like an egg. <laughs> the shell. All, the, oh, absolutely. The whole thing. And it was always interesting to see what they would preach. Because as far as I'm concerned, there's a lot of Jews that said, and um, you guys are monotheists, why? <laughs> it's still one egg, right? <laughs> and, then the, but then, and then the Muslims look at the Jews and say, and you're monotheistic, how? That I don't understand. But the Trinity, as we say, is a mystery. Well, it, yeah. that's what it always comes down to. <laughs> exactly. Punt. <laughs> so, um... So any, I think some other things that are, are worth mentioning about the future that I think are exciting from my perspective. I do love, um, the reason why I'm UCC is uh, not just because I'm gay, that, that, that actually wasn't, at least that was not the reason I told myself. So I was raised congregationalist at UCC. And when I went to divinity school, um, I had to ask myself, I said, well, should I really be Christian? I mean, I'm Christian because I was raised Christian, like I, and I'm in the United States. And I came to the conclusion at the time, I said, well, you know, I, I imagine that Christianity is as good a way to get to God as any other. And since it's culturally, you know, comfortable, I'm not going to sort of intentionally, you know, throw, you know, spit in the face of my culture and go try and do something different. I'm going to say, okay, I, if I can find God in Christianity, great. Then the next question I had was, well, then what denomination I should be? Because I was raised UCC. That doesn't mean I should stay UCC. So I spent the entire first year of divinity school shopping denominations. And I literally would just like stop someone on the street, <laughs> stop on the street, and I'd be, I literally ask them, I was like, well, "What denomination are you?" And they'd tell me, and I said, "Well, why?" Um, <laughs> and I'm like, well, what do you believe? <laughs> and I went to all these different churches, and I was I was pretty obnoxious, but a lot of uh, a lot of seminarians can be very obnoxious um, in, in 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 a loving way. But um, and I came to the I, I I at the end of the year I came I almost became Unitarian, almost became Catholic. And at the end of the year, I came back to UCC. And I came back here because I love the fact that um, it's rooted in the Christian tradition, which is so rich. Because that's one of the complaints we have with the Unitarians. It just, it, it seems um, sort of unrooted. In a postmodern society, that sort of history is actually an incredibly useful tool. 
Uh, but I love the fact that that there was no there were no creeds or confessions. I didn't I wasn't told what to believe, and that I had this entire canvas on which to sort of find my own theology, discover it, you know, interact with these great minds of the past, uh, interact with the great minds in the congregation, and different things throughout my life to have my theology evolve and grow and continue to be what it is, you know, for me. And that just made such sense to me when I was that age. Um, and, and that has always made sense to me. That's one thing that has not changed. Even though my theology has changed, um, that approach uh, to Christian thinking, I think is just fantastic. And I think it's one of the great strengths of the UCC. Uh, obviously our openness and concern for social justice, but I'm someone who loves theology and I love the openness of uh, the UCC to different theological systems. It's like, if you wanna be a process theologian, great, let's explore it together. Um, you know, if you want to explore different things on the atonement, great, let's explore it together. You know, if you want to, like, there are, there are wonderful books written on the spirituality of the church fathers. Let's look at that. You know, let's research that. And, but we don't have to take the Nicene Creed as being the be all end all of faith. If we don't like the Nicene Creed, fine, like, fine, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is, there's this incredible openness that allows you know, individuals in the congregation to wrestle with these things in their lives in a way that I think has real authenticity and integrity. Uh, we don't have to say, oh, you're divorced, so dot, 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 or oh, you're gay, so dot, 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 oh, you don't fit this, dot, dot, that, that's never been the case. And, you know, this is where I love that term from the UCC's, you know, campaign from, you know, 15 years ago, you know, we get to see where God is still speaking, you know, where is God still speaking, you know, that, there's that sense of God still speaking somewhere, and that theological thing, I think, is a great thing, whenever I've talked about that with people who are younger, or people who are non-church, that perspective resonates incredibly, I mean, there is a very rich field of people that I think are hungry for a spiritual community, a spiritual connection to God and others that want to go to a place where people are volunteering their time to make the world better and actually thinking through these issues on how to make the world better. You know, people are despairing all over and churches have an answer and a great answer. And the way that the UCC approaches these questions, I think is one that will resonate with people. Um, I mean, things have been really, this is where it's really fun to work at First Congregational because people show it apart. I mean, here we are super liberal for the memorial area. Uh, and in many ways, just a weird outlier and a whole bunch of misfits. But somehow people find us and they find us, you know, week in and week out. And, you know, we, we've had great engagement online and we just have like, people want this, they want a message, they want to find a place. And that just, I like gives me such hope for the future. I'm like, this is, I, there's always great things happening. You know, I, you know, I love talking to Leslie Jackson about the stuff going on at St. Peter United and the creative stuff we're doing there. I can't wait to hear more about the stuff that you guys are doing, you know, at Bering. And there's, I mean, there's real ministry and real work there. And I'm just, it makes me really optimistic. And, and I think back to say, say, say the 1930s. The 1930s is one of these great low points of American religion. And you know, for all sorts of reasons. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, skepticism about the future of American Christianity. And what's interesting is that with World War II and with the sort of advent of American neo-orthodoxy in the form of Rudolf Bultmann and Paul Tillich, even though they're not, <laughs> they're certainly not Americans, but, you know, they're certainly in that American neo-orthodox world along with, you know, Reinhold and Atrich Niebuhr and others, you know, this whole wave of theology that came in, this whole wave of thinking and approaching things that came in, plus coming out of the Second World War, led to this incredible expansion of the church in the 50s and 60s. And, you know, it, to me, the lesson of that is, um, you know, we've been through different, you know, peaks and valleys before in the history of the church. Uh, the church has been around. And I've always, I always say to people, like, the church will still be around going forward. That's not going to change. What it looks like, I have no idea. Um, but it'll still be around. And as long as, you know, you're, you know, you're true to where God is leading you and true to the gospel. I mean, I just, I think that resonates. And, well, and, and I also think, John, you know, I think you handcuff people when you demand what they believe. Uh, I, I don't think people grow spiritually when you, when you demand that they believe a certain way. Um, and, and, and maybe, and chances are, I always say, well, can, can I belong to the UCC and believe such and such? Um, and, and the reality is that I don't care what the denomination is, people have their own personal theology and they might go along with what they hear uh, at a denominational level, but they believe what they believe. And I think to be a part of a denomination that encourages that kind of uh, exploration and that uh, engagement with God and with theology is incredibly healthy because you know you know those three things where you you behave you believe and you belong 
you've mm -hmm. heard the three Bs. Yeah. Well, historically, most denominations say, okay, here's what you need to believe. And if you behave, well, then we'll let you belong. Well, I maintain that the gift of the UCC, uh, especially I believe in churches like First Congregational and Bering, is that we've reversed it. And it's like, if you come here, you belong. And then you're going to start behaving differently because you belong. And the last thing and the least important thing, I don't mean to discount it, is what you believe. Because that will change and evolve and grow. But the absolute thing is that you belong. And I think when you demand a certain theology, people don't feel like they belong. I think that's a very important thing. If you're, if you're a Methodist, and I notice we've got a couple of, we have a, screen of long time Methodists. Okay, which is your favorite article of religion? Which is your favorite Wesley sermon? Now, are we are required to believe the articles of religion, Wesley's sermon, and maybe it's argued the general rules of the society. I've been reading a book on, the, you know, the, the Anglican church crashed in the 1830s to the 1870s or so. And I realized the other day is because they were the Oxford movement, the discussion of the 39 articles, I realized I missed my chance to be Bearings John Wesley because I wrote the, Congre the Constitution, which has uh, what we believe in. And I could have taken our articles of religion and X'd out the ones I didn't like and put it in the Constitution. But it, You're still the John Wesley of, of Bearings. Not really, not really. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, no, I, I, I believe that there's a lot to be said for the unexamined life, and that puts me out of Wesley's. There's that. So in the last few minutes here, are there any questions that people might have um, and, or other sort of input on the future stuff? Because this is a fascinating conversation. Um, and again, I just threw out some things just because I thought they were interesting for me to talk about. But is there anything that anyone here wants to engage with or bring up? One of the questions, and it kind of goes back to the belong, you know, belong, believe, whatever order they come in, depending on where you are. but. It, it seems to me like most, maybe this is my bias, but it seems like people belong to Bering because they feel like they belong there. Rather, you know, and there's people that are Baptist or people that are Catholic, there are people that are Methodist, there are people, and a lot of people maybe don't even have a belief system, you know, but they know Bering does good work and, and you know, they've heard of, and, you know, I'm not sure what my question is exactly, but but it's like um, I, I guess what once you get to a belief system, you know, behaving is kind of problematic, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I think people behave too, but but you know, maybe. You know, maybe maybe they're not even necessarily Christian, but they belong to Bering because they feel comfortable there, and you know, you know, they don't know anything else. I mean, you know, maybe maybe they would be Jewish, or maybe they would be, you know. We actually have some Buddhists that come regularly. I was going to say, Buddhists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and there and there's certainly people at First Congregational I've had conversations with about. Um, where they're like, you know, I don't really identify as being a Christian, but I really like FCC. And I'm like, great, <laughs> that's totally fine. And I, and I and think they do for the, in, even though I don't know that they could articulate it, because we're in the process of doing some visioning, so we've been interviewing people. And I think this concept of belonging is absolutely uh, inherent at FCC. Uh, they talk about the relationships and that they feel like they belong. Yeah. John? John? Yeah. I had a mentor who told me that there, there were no atheists from when he was in World War II. There were no atheists in a foxhole. And I think our country has been in a foxhole this past year, and it's caused people to, to struggle and, and um, reach out, I think, more to uh, their spiritual and religious uh, uh, quest. And from 100 years ago, when we had the uh, social, uh, what was the social gospel, you're talking about theology. They used to say that we're the only gospel that a lot of people will ever see. 
is who we are. And so much as I would love to hear you preach on Sunday, uh, I think each of us is preaching every day with who we are and how we live. Yeah, I think this, I mean, the, I, I, I'm one of these people who adopts uh, the perspective of, of, of someone like uh, Tillich or Richard Niebuhr on these things, where um, uh, the reality is, in terms of faith, is that we all have centers of value, as someone like Niebuhr would say. Uh, we all have an ultimate concern, as someone like uh, Tillich would say. Um, and the question is what it is. Um, and we all have, because we all have this inherent need to search for meaning. Uh, it's a question of where you find that meaning um, and whether or not where you find that meaning actually um, has value that endures um, through thick and thin. And that's one thing that I think the Christian message uh, is very powerful with. Um, I mean, people make, people make, this is one of the, I mean, to look at a field day with America today. Um, I mean, if you read any of his stuff, he says one of the problems in Nazi Germany, I mean, the Nazis were a religion. Uh, people had faith in them. Um, I mean, this is how they had, this is, this is why it was so fanatical. Um, but it was, you know, faith in the wrong thing. And you see that coming up again and again in American society. The classic thing has always been towards materialism. Um, but you, you see this scary religion showing up on the right uh, that frightens me, um, you know, where the, 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 the discussion over the capital insurrection is a great example, uh, or the sort of voter fraud. There's, there's no logic there. It's, it, it gets to a place where, you know, it's a, it's a scary uh, scary place because it's this search for meaning, as you're saying, John. People have this need for meaning, and they're finding it in various places. The problem is pointing out that that's not the place you want to find it, um, <laughs> you know, um, and for all sorts of reasons. And so, you know, I think that, yeah, I mean, I would say there, you know, no one's. I mean, I, this is where, you know, atheists always hate when you say this, but it's like, you know, I mean, you believe in something. You have you have a set of values. Um, you have something that guides you. You have something that gives you meaning and purpose. Um, we all have that. That's that's what faith is, um, you know. And the question is, this is why I always say that some atheists too. I'll never listen to this. <laughs> Sorry, I go on these. This is the problem you talk to a preacher. Um, I remember, you know, one of my friends wanted me to debate uh, religion with one of his buddies, who apparently big time atheist didn't like Christianity. I'm like, okay, fine, sure. So I uh, I meet up with this guy, um, and we start chatting. Uh, we actually meeting up at JR's. Um, it's a great place of a theological conversation. So we're meeting up at JR's, that back bar on the other side of the pool table, and we're talking about God. I said, so, okay, um, so you don't believe in, you don't believe in God. No. I'm like, okay, so what do you believe in? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, what are your, what are your ethics? What are your, what's your morality? Like, what do you, what do you stand by? Like, what do you, what do you believe in? And he's like, well, I, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, you went to Rice University and you can't tell me what you, anything about what you believe in or your ethics or what's right and what's wrong or how you gave, go through that. Did you take any course in moral reasoning at all whatsoever? He said, no, I didn't. I'm like, That's not how are we, why are we having this conversation? I'm like, have you taken any courses in philosophy, religion? He said, no. And I'm like, well, what? this is a total, I turned to my friend, this is a total waste of my time. <laughs> I was a little frustrated. I had a couple of drinks too, so I was, uh, I had my frustration level. I had that conversation with somebody who asked me about religion. I said, well, if you want to know about religion, look at your checkbook and your uh, uh, day timer. That'll tell you where your religion is. Your yeah, story, maybe. John, would be more impressive had it been at the mining company. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the more I see, about, I say? <laughs> the more I see about the UCC, I'm sort, I'm rather embarrassed that I stayed a Methodist as long as I have. It's, the UCC is a great denomination. I've loved it. It's been. It's been rich. It's been so rich for me. And I especially I and this is the whole thing like with Bering too. Like the thing I love about it, the, you know, the people who show up at UCC churches are the type of people that I'm like, I just love that. Here are people who are giving up their time and their money and all these different things to try and follow God's way, trying to be a good disciple, try and make the world a better place and it, I, and try and live by grace and these different things. I mean, it just blows my socks off. I mean, the fact that I get to get paid for doing what I do. I get paid. I get paid. I get paid pretty well, too. I'm just shocking. Uh, you know. I don't think that, you know, there might be some, I don't think you could tell the difference between the congregation at Bering and the congregation at First Congregational. No. You know, no. Or, or Plymouth or, uh, you know, because we're all, you know, on that same path, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we might articulate it a little bit differently and we might have different ethics or you know things that we hold dear but um i i see us as being people who um want to make a difference in the world uh, and um uh, i mean you guys have been doing it for decades centuries 
Almost. Well, that's the that's the founding myth. But um, yeah, you know, members of Bering, they're not there because they're Methodists. They're there because of Bering and what Bering has done in the community. And if they thought about it, it's basically living out the gospel, or at least one expression of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to refer to what Lynette said a minute ago about uh, Bering having things re in reverse of the other. I, I having been only been there at couple of years that's the first thing I felt when I walked into that congregation was I felt like I belonged yep. and that's what that's what attracted me there I felt like I don't have to prove anything I belong be just because I'm here yeah because I think the same thing's true at first don't you John I don't think there's a there's a core group of people who are at first because it's a UCC church but the majority of people who stay is because they love First Congregational. Uh, they don't necessarily have a great affinity for the denomination. It is enriched their lives. They just don't know it. Right. That's true yeah. for most people at Bering, too. Yeah. 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 It is. It is. For, for, for most people at Bering, uh, well, the weddings and all that, but I mean, the they won't notice a change because they're not there because of our denominational affiliation. But I think what's going to be exciting, this just, you know, my pr profit hat on, is, you know, the community at large, you know, all those people yeah. that you talked about, Diane, that have stayed away because they go, I can't do this. I can't be a part of this, yeah. you know, and, and the press that you've got. Now, I think you, you better clean off those pews. <laughs> yeah. Two members of Bering. Two members of Bering who I'm got really there are two I members to, of Bering who got sick and tired run. and they went to Bethel and they helped move Bethel to the retreat center. Yeah. Right. All right. I, I, I've got to run. Um, thank you all thank very much. I appreciate it. Uh, it's been a lot of fun over the last five weeks. So thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. Okay. I, look forward to, I look forward to see you all, uh, to see you all around at, at different things. Uh, certainly on, you know, June 6th. Um, I look forward to being there. Um, and, you know, many things in the future. Uh, again, I'm really optimistic. I am so excited that you guys have uh, made this leap. I know it's not an easy one, but I, I, I feel in my heart of hearts from everything I know about bearing it's the right one. And I am really excited about the ministry we're going to do together uh, between these different churches. So um, thank, you thank you so you. much. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right.